Hey guys, John here. Welcome back to the series, How to Use Maximus. This is video six, and today we are talking about the histogram and all the fun settings that it comes with. So let's go to a default patch here on the top right, select default to make sure everything is reset. And on the bottom right, where we see the speed control, there's a little button, that little circle on the right of that. It's kind of easy to overlook, so let's go ahead and select that. It's going to light up red to make sure it's on. And now let's play something and see what we see. So this view here is going to be our histogram, and this is gonna be our full frequency spectrum of our signal. So let's turn down our track a little bit here so we can kind of see what's going on with a little music in the background to kind of compare what we hear and what we see. So this menu here, this little triangle that's right above the pre knob and the gain section, let's go ahead and select that. And there's a lot of different entries in here, but we're gonna be mainly diving into the histogram settings and all the stuff that does in here. So with this menu open, this first enabled is gonna be on by default, which is why we are seeing this in the first place. You can always right click in a menu and change different options and keep the menu open as opposed to left clicking your selection and the menu will close. So if you wanna keep the menu open, right click as opposed to left click. So let's right click this and turn this back on. And then moving on, we have a range. Now we have minus 60, we have minus 90 and minus 120. So minus 60, you can see this weight or this histogram is gonna be dropped here. 120 is going to be raising above this line. And this is basically metering the lowest dB activity. And by default is gonna be 90. So I generally don't really see you having to change this in many situations, but it is good to know that it's there. Now moving on from range, we have pivot slope. So by default here, it's gonna be at 4.5, but let's go to zero right here and we can see how this slopes down. Now this is just a visual representation. It's not actually going to change your signal. This is just changing how we see it on the graph here. Now, if we go to pivot slope over here back to, or not back to, but over to six, we can see it changes again. Now, according to the manual, this 4.5 selection here is gonna be more so what our ears hear. And this is gonna be what we're seeing here is more so like how we are going to envision this sound that we're hearing. So it's more accurate. It's kind of keeping your eyes and your ears more so linked into what we see and what we hear. So at this spot here, we can kind of see it's for the most part, a, definitely a flat mix here. The, the lows are kind of a little bit above this middle line here. So there might be a little bit more lows in that sense. The highs are kind of peaking up here. So it's kind of a good way to see if, you know, maybe I do have a lot of low end or maybe I don't have enough mid range. You can kind of reference this graph within reason and see how much is, uh, is missing or how much is too much or something like that. So definitely a good, uh, option to have this here as well. Now we have frequency precision. So let's go to low, for example. And you might not notice a huge change here by looking at this, but if we go to highest, this is a huge difference here. So now this precision of drawing this signal here is gonna be much more precise. So for example, on a lot of my stuff, a lot of my kick drums either I'll make or I'll use, I EQ them in a certain way that I really hone in on about 50 to 49 Hertz and really get that fundamental going. And we can see that reflected here almost perfectly right here on 50, smack dab right there. So. That's how I know how accurate this is because I always set my fundamentals around 50. And if we go back to this frequency precision, we go to low, we can see it's kind of hovering over that 50, but it's not really very precise. So in that situation, if you want a really precise reading, go down to the precision and put it to high. But keep in mind, this will be a little bit more strain on your CPU visually, that is. It's not going to necessarily change the signal. It's just kind of changing how we interpret and what we see. So definitely good to notice that as well. And there might be times in your signal where you notice maybe something's poking out or there might be a certain frequency that might be kind of like it sounds like a feedback or a little spike there and you can't really find it because in this low it's kind of hard to see where it's happening here so in that situation you can always go to precision and go to heist and really find something maybe it's this guy that's kind of really ruining your mix or something like that so you can find where that is and then you can maybe notch that out with an eq later after the fact or something like that so it's definitely good to know where things are in your mix and what's happening at all times so moving on from there, this is kind of a good segue into the smoothing and the average mode. So average mode and smoothing, these two are going to be working in tandem. So by default, average mode is off and it's more so looking at the peaks of your signal. And under time smoothing, right now it's default on medium. However, if we go to slowest, we can see how much is slowing down and this is slowing down how, how long it takes for these peaks to fall back down. If we go to fast, it's gonna be quite a wild party there. So yeah, so like I said, if you're in frequency precision, you're in high and you're kind of looking for something here, you can go to time smoothing and go to maybe slowest and be like, this is the exact one that I was looking for. It's coming up again somewhere. Bam, there it is. That's the one that's ruining my mix. Or it's, it might be this guy, who knows? But at least you know where to look and how to slow things down to kind of look at things through a kind of a microscope if you want to think of it that way. 
Now let's turn average mode on. And now this is going to more so be reading the RMS. So the average level of your song, because peaks can be really loud and quick, but our ears aren't necessarily going to notice them as that loud. It's just going to be a quick little peak and it's gone. The averageness is what our ears more so hear as, as loudness. So keeping that in mind, now we have our different time smoothing here, and this is going to be determining the length or the smoothingness of that. So, and we have the same settings as well. So we have the fastest here, and then we have the slowest as well right there. And it's kind of slowing down or speeding up the averageness of what we're seeing here. So this is definitely a good menu to kind of get familiar with too, because it, like I was saying, if you're trying to find something in your mix or your master or something like that that's bugging you and, you and you can't really find it, you can't scoop it out where it is, this visual feedback is really going to help you as well. And sometimes you can even load in a spectrogram after the fact to kind of maybe dial something in and stuff like that. And later on through this course, we're going to actually do some practical stuff with this and maybe build a, a smaller mastering session because in, in a sense here, let me pause this music just for a second. I think we've heard enough here. So an interesting thing to think about is a lot of the times, Mastering gets this almost curious dark arts kind of thing and really it shouldn't be because you're really bringing stuff up to the right level. You're really making sure that the low end is not ruining anything else because if you have some low end rumble that you really can't hear, that's going to be adding to your overall loudness, preventing your song from actually sounding louder that, or at the target level and not sounding as good as it can. So things with mastering is kind of correcting the EQ, maybe in the very, very low end, maybe removing something bad or something like that. But at the end of the day, if the mix is not good, there's nothing really you can do to get a great master from it. You can kind of work around it to a certain extent, but if the mix is bad, the master will also be bad. So this brings to another point as well. Sometimes we have a session going on and we start to put Maximus on our master channel in our mixing session and we start getting used to that and we like doing that, but that becomes a problem later on because if you're mixing something and you have your Maximus on your master channel the whole time, you're not necessarily cha making changes to your mix. You're making changes to your mix that's getting run through the master with different bands that are having different adjustments. So you're kind of chasing your tail in the long run because let's say you make a small change in Maximus and then a lot of stuff might be now wrong in your mix. So that's something also to keep in mind. You might have a huge session and you might have a lot of stuff going. You might have synthesizers going. You might have a lot of plugins going. You might have a lot of audio files. Who knows what you have going on in your session, but after a while they build up and they cost more CPU over time. And then you have a master track that has a lot of CPU intensive plugins. You might have a lot of maybe OTT, whatever it is you use, maybe Maximus, maybe a different mastering plugin or something like that. And you start stacking stuff up. You're going to start choking your computer more and more and more and more, which is not necessarily a good idea. And then the concept past that is once we have a, if we have a mastering session where we just print a mix and we bring that mix into a mastering session, by doing it that way, we have a session dedicated just for mastering and we have a lot more CPU resource to apply to this session. Not to mention if we have one, two, three, four, five songs. So in our playlist here, we just have one song right now, but later on we're gonna bring in some more. And the whole idea with mastering, for example, is if we have multiple different songs, they're not gonna be exactly tonally the same. So it's gonna be our job in mastering to kind of make one song the way we want it to sound like, and then we save those settings and apply that to the next song as a starting base, and then we can further define and kind of match the tonality of the first song, which is helpful to have a spectrum view and different kind of analysis tools and visually see how different these songs sound from each other and how much we have to change them to match the first one. Because once we have the first song ma mastered at the right level, at the right tonality, once we have all that done, that's 90% of our job already done. Then we have to apply that same settings to the next ones and kind of match it to the first one. So basically everything sounds the same. If you're recording a band and you know they recorded a whole album in maybe half the album in New York and the other one somewhere in Europe or something like that in a different room with different mics maybe, and then they bring all this to one mastering session, you have to basically make fool the ear in a way to make it sound like the band is playing in the same room at the same time. Because when we listen to records, they're not vastly different tonality wise from each other. Sure, they're different songs, but the kick and the bass level is going to sound pretty much the same for all the same tracks as far as the mids and the highs. So it's making consistency over a lot of different song or songs or files that maybe have inconsistencies in them. Not to mention when we listen to a CD, if we even do that anymore, or a, 
you know, even on Spotify, when the songs fade in next to each other like that, that's a very calculated move. So let's say, for example, I have this song here. And let's say, for example, I put this over here like that, right? And here's another song, for example. What I'm going to do is if I have a selection here and we press play, let's turn this up here just a bit here. The song is fading out and there's still some delays going. And then it's right here. Bam, the song is done. Now, now we almost have to feel when we want the next song to come. And let's say we want it to come right around here. Then right here, wherever we want it to do, we're going to press Alt-T, make a marker, and say here, or whatever you want to call it. And this is going to be the end point of the song. And this is going to be where the next one is going to begin. So then once we go to export it, we're going to actually select the whole song in addition to this ending right here, this, this whole empty space right there. And that's going to give the feel of the songs fading out and you have a little bit of second to pause and to breathe and then the next song come in comes in so that's another aspect of mastering which we're going to talk all a little bit more in depth about this later on if that's uh, something you want to know about or something like that let me know in the comments below if that's kind of another subject of this whole situation if you want to talk about because Max maximus is used a lot in mastering and there's a lot more to mastering than just making your tracks loud or something like that so yeah, so this video went a little bit too long than I intended to, but I thought I would mention that because it's a very important aspect of this whole process. So within a nutshell, that's how the histogram works. Coming back to this here, definitely play around with this, get used to it because there will be a time where you're going to need this and you're gonna need some visual feedback and this is the menu where you can do it at as well. And for the next video, we're gonna briefly talk about the heat map as well and how that also works. It's kind of similar in the visual aspect, but a slightly little different way. So thank you so much for watching. This course has been awesome so far and we'll see you in the next video.